Hey guys, thanks for joining me today. Uh, I'm sorry again that we have to, to do this in our uh, online format, but uh, sometimes these things just can't be avoided. I apologize, the video uh, is, is not higher quality here. I, the, the webcams on these laptops aren't the best, so uh, you're going to have to deal with it uh, as it comes here. Um, so today is our first lecture on the uh, Civil War, and uh, you know we've been building to this point for uh, literally weeks in our class looking at all the various causes uh, as far back uh, starting with colonialism and, and uh, you know the emergence of, uh, of slavery as a, a major uh, source of income especially for the south and uh, you know the evils that that brought and, and the divisions that were created very early on uh, they are all coming to a climax right here at this time uh, you know the Civil War is it's an exciting uh, subject to study. Um, but I, as always, I want you to remember that, uh, ultimately this, this, uh, there's a lot of tragic elements to this. Um, this was America's deadliest war. Um, there were a total, almost 700,000 people that were killed. Uh, and that's just, uh, people that were fighting. There were about 50,000, uh, citizens that, that died. Um, so you know, this is a, a national tragedy of a scope that we've never even come close to since that time, thankfully. Um, so uh, over the course of the uh, unit, we are going to take a look at not only uh, the, the strategies of both sides of leadership, both in terms of the, the governments, but also uh, among the generals. Um, we're going to take a look at some of the key battles. We don't have time to look at all of the battles, of course, but uh, we're going to look at some of the key battles and um, what's, uh, you know, what the results were uh, and short-term and long-term effects there. Um, ultimately, after we conclude the war, we're going to uh, start part two of this unit, and we'll be taking a look at uh, Reconstruction, which in all my years of education, I always felt like got skipped over quite a bit, and uh, that's a real, uh, that's a tragedy in and of itself, because, you know, this, sadly, this country has a lot of, of history of, of uh, negative race relations, and, well, you really can't understand even modern race relations without going back and taking a look at uh, what was happening uh, in those days following the Civil War. Uh, you'll hear me say it time and again in these series that the North won the war, but the South won Reconstruction. And that's very, very true. So just a couple of reminders before we get started with the, the material. You are responsible for taking notes during uh, these lectures. We're going to treat them just like a normal lecture. Um, I would ask that you reserve the columns of your notebooks uh, for questions. I want you to be asking questions. I'm not doing these lectures live, but uh, that doesn't mean that you can't uh, ask any questions that you guys have. So please jot those down. Um, we will have weekly live discussion meetings uh, in which I would like to hear some of those questions and I can answer them for you at that time. Um, uh, you can always email me for clarification, things like that. So with that being said, let's go ahead and jump into it. Let me get the uh, PowerPoint up here. Give me one second. All right. I think we have started recording again. So I am going to uh, go ahead and begin. All right. So uh, let's look at just some of the, the basic um, uh, facts here, 1861 to 1865, this war would last for um, four years. And uh, like I said before, you know, ultimately, by the end of it, we're going to see upwards of almost a million people dead. Um, and, you know, some of these numbers are hard to to come by. We uh, we know, you, you know, usually on both sides, kind of the official tallies after battles. But, um, you know, there were a lot of people that were lost um, that uh, you know, never were officially counted. I know in my personal family history, my, uh, my mom's family grew up in, in the mountains of Virginia. And, um, I remember one story that's been passed down to us was that, uh, at, at one point, and I kind of lost track at my great, great grandfather, great, great, great grandfather, um, that, uh, one day a couple soldiers came to, uh, the house in which my, my, uh, my ancestors lived. And, uh, they basically took, um, one of my great, great uncles that, uh, they accused of being, uh, someone who had, had left the army, um, gone AWOL and, uh, they, they tore him out of the house. And, um, the, as family legend goes, the, they, about, about 30 minutes later, they heard gunfire from, um, 
a ways away across the hill and, and they never saw him again. So, you know, just things like that uh, in which families are ripped apart by this. Um, you know, I, I never want to forget that, uh, that sad tragedy because as exciting and heroic as this story can be at some point, ultimately this, this is a tragedy uh, uh, deep down and, and some scars that had truly never healed. So uh, let's go ahead and jump into it. Um, so the first step that we're, what we're going to look at here is the historiography. Uh, we haven't talked about historiography in, in name uh, much since that first unit, but remember historiography is um, how history is told. And that uh, the Civil War is perhaps the greatest example in American history of that because the tales have changed over time. The perspectives uh, that have been given uh, honestly tend to reflect more uh, the struggles of the, the modern society than they do the actual war itself. So, uh, you know, keep that in mind. So let, let's go ahead and take a look at some of the basic viewpoints of what we've seen over the years, um, how the Civil War has been uh, talked about and written about since that time. So we'll start with both the Northern and the Southern view from the uh, from the get-go, 1860. So right in the thick of it, the people that were living through it, uh, that survived it, you know, how did they uh, view this war? Well, the, the normal, uh, excuse me, the Northern view during that period, uh, they really saw that this war was a result of uh, slave owners, uh, that the conspiracy of, of the slave owners to force this immoral institution upon them. We saw a lot of anger in our last unit with uh, the expansion of slavery and uh, how, how uh, many Northerners were against the expansion. It may, it may not have been against slavery in general um, for the vast majority of, of normal Northerners, but they were against the expansion of it for the most part. Um, the, the Dred Scott case, how uh, you know, slavery made its way into a free state and uh, was kind of allowed to, to stand uh, legalities excluded there. Um, so, you know, the Northerners during this period really feel as if their, their main, uh, the, the main reason that they fought this war was to defend the Constitution and to protect the Union, um, really against the aggression of the South. So that, that's the main thing I want you to take away from this. The Northern view during that time period and immediately following was they believed that they were protecting the Constitution and, and saving the Union. Now, for Southerners, uh, you can probably imagine the, the Southern uh, storyline that emerged after this. Um, many Southerners did not necessarily see slavery as the cause. Uh, they instead saw that the North was acting unconstitution, uh, unconstitutionally, and they believed that the Northerners were the ones that were being aggressive, uh, and uh, they, they were, you know, uh, you know, with, with Lincoln declaring a draft, which we'll talk about more in depth here in a second, uh, they really thought that Lincoln was an extremist, that the Republican, by electing him, the North was, uh, you know, trying to abolish slavery uh, through Congress. And, and anyways, uh, they really saw uh, that, that there was a lot of unconstitutionality going on uh, against their right to own slaves. And so it's two different viewpoints uh, that they both believe they're defending the Constitution, but in, in two very different ways. Um, the, uh, the, the third view there, the avoidable conflict, this was uh, a view that was held by some. And uh, frankly, it kind of blamed both sides. And I think there's probably some merit to this. Um, where Northerners were, were to blame, uh, Northern fanatics were to blame, and Southern extremists were, were to blame as well. Um, but they, there was a certain sect of society that did see this as an avoidable conflict, that um, the, the war was a result of, of the extremists on both sides uh, kind of getting their way. They, they were done talking. Uh, they wanted to fight this thing out, and ultimately they both believed that they would come out on top. If, uh, if they were allowed to, to fight it out. So, um, uh, but either way, they, they saw it as avoidable. They didn't think that uh, it had to come to war. They didn't think that war was necessary at that time. We've seen the last few decades leading up to this point uh, where the, um, uh, each president has kind of continued to push the issue off to the next president. And uh, ultimately, you know, it fell to Buchanan, who we saw really didn't do much and, and often is considered one of the worst presidents, uh, according to uh, modern day historians. 
Let's move on down to letter D, the nationalist view. Now, you'll notice the time period has changed on us here, the 1890s. So we're a couple decades afterwards. Uh, the 1890s are, are an interesting uh, time because, you know, we've emerged uh, after Reconstruction. Uh, Reconstruction ended about 13 years earlier. Um, and this is kind of a continuation. I think both sides have recognized by this point that uh, it probably could have been um, – uh, uh, well, excuse me, that, that both sides kind of recognized that uh, slavery was going to have to uh, be dealt with. E either we were going to go all in or all out. I'm reminded of, of Lincoln's a house divided speech, right? He said, we're going to be all one thing or another. And we got to decide which it's going to be. Are we going to be all slave? Or are we going to be all free? Um, and, and he was right. Um, so I, I think by the 1890s, uh, the writings that we see uh, among uh, contemporary historians of that day are kind of more of a nationalist view uh, that that look at you know what tore this nation apart were the sectional differences and um, <clears throat> that ultimately we we did have to fall under one system you know you also think of the 1890s the industrial revolution is really picking up uh, and you're you're seeing the 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 entire nation start to uh, industrialize more but definitely centered in in the north of course um, so this this nationalist view that uh, perhaps it was unavoidable, but um, it was more sectional differences that, uh, uh, you know, we were trying to decide sectional policy at a national level. And it just, it doesn't, doesn't work. So uh, the nationalist view said that it was really unavoidable um, and that it was uh, more about kind of the, the changing nation. Uh, but yet these sections, these uh, regions were kind of left behind. Um, and then we get down to letter E. Uh, the, the Southern nationalism. I'll tell you, this one, uh, I think, the, perhaps the uh, most important from this list for you to understand. Um, you know, today we have a lot of, uh, you know, I, I've said, especially with this, going into this unit, there's a lot of myths about the Civil War, about, um, you know, either stories that happened or, you know, why it was fought, things like that. Um, I think a lot of the myths um, that, that I hold to be incorrect or um, kind of a, a twisting of the, the real narrative uh, come from the Southern nationalist viewpoint uh, of the 1930s and 40s. So, you know, before I begin describing this, I want you to think about, you know, what's happening at that time, 1930s, 1940s, um, especially in relation to Jim Crow. Right, so it's been 30 years now that um, Plessy versus Ferguson had been decided, and segregation is is basically legal throughout the country. Uh, again, the South winning Reconstruction. Um, this viewpoint comes at a time where I think the civil rights movement is really starting to amp up, um, and you know I think this is a response to that. Uh, these Southern nationalists. Um, this is where we start to see. Uh, what's referred to as the lost cause, right? That, uh, that really Southerners were fighting uh, for this lost cause of statehood uh, and states' rights, our, our right to do what we want within our state, not be told what to do by a federal government. Um, this is where that, that lost cause mentality, like, oh, we, we lost the war, but now, now is the time to pick up the banner. Right. All of that's coinciding because the civil rights movement is starting to grow. Um, and I mean, it's in its early stages, of course. The World War II would be a major catalyst uh, for that. But um, but still, this is where Jim Crow is really getting, um, I mean, solidified in the South. And you see a response, uh, you know, to that, that, you know, that was our, our uh, grandparents generation. And again, I think that's a big part of it, too, the timing. Uh, the, the Civil War generation is dying at this time. They are, they're watching this generation uh, pass. And um, so number one, we're seeing a lot of things like monuments go up. Almost all the Civil War monuments for the Confederacy uh, were created during this time, almost all of them. Um, so, you know, to me, like, I don't know, not that you're in it from my viewpoint, but, um, you know, we have these conversations about Confederate memorials and I know it's a very divisive, um, a very divisive topic. Um, but I, I think what really started to kind of shape my perspective on it uh, was not only there, there's a quote by Robert E. Lee about um, uh, about 
monuments like that, basically keeping the wounds of war open. Uh, that that really uh, kind of hit home to me because I, I think he was, even in that time period, I think he was um, against that. But we really don't see them until the 1930s. And I think it's kind of this resurgence of this lost cause that, that, the, that their grandparents' generation failed in this effort to solidify states' rights. And you know what? It's going to be their generation that finally does it through segregation and Jim Crow that, uh, that they may not be fighting a war, but they are going to be uh, fighting their generation's fight. So the Southern nationalist perspective, um, you know, it kind of centers around, uh, again, blaming the North. This is where you start, um, you know, seeing the resurgence of, of the Civil War called the War of Northern Aggression, which uh, came from in the 1860s. That's not a new term, but uh, that is where you start seeing this, this revival of that term, the War of Northern Aggression. And they really thought that, um, I have a phrase in my notes, egocentric sectionalism. All right, break that apart. Egocentric. It's all about yourself, right? Sectionalism. They're blaming the North. So what they're saying is that this was the North's ego, okay? This was the North saying that they were better than them. This was the North saying that um, because they were industrialized, they had more people, um, that they were more civilized, whatever, um, that this was the North uh, and their e egocentric sectionalism that caused this war. So they're laying blame on the North, not slavery, not the fact that they owned human beings and shackled them up, but uh, they're laying blame on, uh, on the North that, you know, we had maintained this balance for decades, which is true, uh, you know, in the Senate, you know, adding two states at a time, one free, one slave. They maintained this balance, but man, 1861, uh, you know, Northerners are really trying to, um, you know, they're not playing by the rules anymore, right? They're, they're not allowing uh, slavery to exist. So I think that that period is such a key in understanding, um, frankly, even our own perspective on, on this uh, material today. All right, let's move down to the uh, revisionist school in the 1930s and 40s. Um, also, think about what's happening, again, during this time period. Think about what historians are witnessing in the news as they're writing these things. Uh, this is the, the rise of, of dictators. Uh, this is the rise of, of uh, totalitarian states in Nazi Germany. Um, you know, we're seeing uh, Joseph Stalin uh, in, in Soviet Union. Um, we're, we're seeing, you know, Imperial Japan rising up. Um, so I think this revisionist school... Um, you know, they're watching as war is, is almost upon them, right? They, they could see it happening and they're, they're blaming, uh, people they're, they're blaming, uh, even in their own society, the, the fact that these politicians can't get their act together and, and they're going to have to fight a war eventually, not, not the politicians, they never have to fight, but the, uh, the people, all right. And so the historians kind of reflect upon that with the Civil War. And the, the, the perspective of the revisionist school was that um, the war itself was brought upon by the failings of that, that generation before, the 1850s into the 60s, that, um, that they could have been settled through political means, um, but they were magnified by extremists. They allowed extremists to have more of a view, have more of a voice in those societies and, um, you know, the revisionist school said war happened because of the failure of leadership in that generation. You know, again, they're, they're on the cusp of World War II, and uh, they were living through the same thing. They're, they're like, everybody could see this happening, uh, you know, the Nazi war machine growing stronger every day, but no one was stepping up to do anything. Um, it was the same thing. So, again, reflection of the time. Um, motivations. Um, let's talk about that. Um, you know, each soldier, uh, had different reasons for joining and, and, you know, I, I've made the comment multiple times in my class, you know, we cannot throw a blanket, uh, statement over everyone or every person in a region and say that this is how they felt. People joined for different, uh, different reasons. Um, you know, some for the North joined up for preservation of the union, you know, some of it, some of that is accurate. Uh, some of them joined up because they, they thought slavery should end. Um, I, I mean, again, it, it, there, were, there were vast motivations. Same thing for the Southerners, okay? Some of them, um, you know, the vast majority of, of Southerners didn't own slaves. 
Um, but that being said, uh, you know, they're, the Southerners are, are fighting to defend a way of life um, and what they believe are their rights. And I always put an asterisk on that. Their right to own another human being. Okay, don't forget that part of the story. Um, it's also possible that some people just thought that, uh, you know, slavery, uh, you know, needed to continue and that um, whether it was because of their economic investment in it or whatever it may be that uh, some people may have joined just to, to protect that institution of slavery. My point being, we cannot uh, throw a blanket over each person that joined and said, um, you know, they were uh, an evil racist or, uh, you know, in the Northern perspective, you know, that they were, um, you know, a, a God fearing abolitionist. We, we can't say that. We, we just, you know, that some joined for those reasons and, and others did not. So let's jump on to uh, the, the next page here. Um, get to the war. Well, we're not actually not going to talk about the war itself today, but uh, instead we are going to be comparing the, the northern and southern um, uh, regions uh, going into this war because uh, we have to compare these. The war, in a lot of ways, the war kind of plays out on paper even before the fighting actually begins. So uh, let, let's talk about some of these comparisons here. Uh, first of all, population. And I start with population because it is perhaps the uh, the most important distinguishing factor uh, we have. So uh, some statistics that I, I want you guys to, to jot down. Um, so let's compare the populations of the North and the South. The North had 22 and a half million people. Okay, 22 and a half million people. Um, the Southerners, there are a total of uh, 9 million white people. Okay. Now there were another 4 million people in the South, but they're all enslaved. And you best believe that they are not going to be signing those people up uh, immediately and handing them weapons, you know, releasing them from shackles and, oh, here's a rifle. No way. Uh, now we will talk later on about how uh, there, there were uh, African Americans that fought for the South. Seems kind of twisted, but uh, it did occur. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll get to that at one point. Um, but uh, again, let's compare these numbers. North, 22, uh, 20, 20 and a half uh, million people. Um, they're going to raise an army initially of uh, just over 2 million troops. Um, what's interesting when you break those numbers down is that a quarter of Union soldiers were foreign born. Okay? They were not born within the United States. Um, to me, uh, this, this just solidifies even more that uh, perspective I, I have told you guys from day one, how much geography dictates history. Okay? Geography dictates history. You know, northern, uh, the northern region, if you're immigrating from, excuse me, if you're immigrating from Europe, Okay, that northern region is the first stop when you're coming into the United States, right? And it's also where the major cities are because it's the closest to Europe. Um, it's where the major cities are. It's where factory jobs are. Um, you know, it's where most immigrants are moving to, places like New York, Boston, okay? Um, those, those big major port cities. Um, they're, they're getting off the boat and that's where they're staying because many of them are poor and they can't go elsewhere by farmland or any of that. So one fourth are union of union soldiers uh, were foreign born. Okay. That is a major difference between the North and the South in this fight is that, uh, you know, for every uh, you know, Northerner that dies, I mean, he can be replaced by, uh, you know, somebody that just came off the boat. There's a famous scene from, uh, um, Forgot it. Gangs of New York. If you've never seen that movie, um, wait until you turn 17 because I think it's rated R. But uh, there's a famous scene where these guys are getting off the boat, like from Ireland, and like as soon as they step off the boat, there's a Union Army like uh, table there to recruit uh, people right off the boat. Um, so you know, for every Northern soldier that died, you know, it sounds coarse to say it, but he was replaceable. Okay. And, um, you know, in many of these Northern victories, um, even some losses, they're just going to be throwing tons of people at them. In fact, uh, Ulysses S. Grant, I mean, midway through this war is not really a hero. I mean, they call him the butcher um, because of his tactics of, of just kind of throwing guys into the fight, um, regardless of, uh, you know, how many would, would actually die. And that, that did bother him. Um, but that's another topic. Um, but, uh, you know, the North, um, 
uh, so the North has more than twice the amount of people, okay, 22 and a half compared to 9 million uh, fighting or uh, population in general. Um, the, the South, when we're comparing the Northern and Southern armies, okay, I, I mentioned that the North would have a, an initial army of, of just over 2 million, uh, or total, I believe, 2, two million total uh, over the course of the war. Um, the, the total army for the South would not even reach 1 million. Okay? They would have less than half of the fighting force. Um, the, uh, the, the totals that I saw were about 850,000 uh, men total that were fighting um, in the, uh, in the Southern army. Um, and, and it may have been less than that. Um, <clears throat> now, one thing that uh, Southerners do have an advantage in uh, is that many of the major military institutes are located right there in Virginia uh, and, and throughout the South. Uh, I, I will tell you that the North wins the population battle here, but um, when it comes to leadership um, on the field, generals in the field, uh, Southern armies are going to be much better um, uh, prepared, not, not with supplies, but, uh, they'll be much better prepared in terms of strategy. And, um, and, and that's reflected in the first two years of fighting in, uh, how successful they are. So, um, so yeah, the uh, biggest takeaway here, the, the populations North and South North has a lot more people. Uh, South has, has, um, a good amount of people, but, uh, you've decided to enslave uh, a good percentage of them. Therefore, uh, they're, they're, they're not usable. Um, let's move down to uh, drafts. Um, the uh, both armies, in both armies, about four fifths, okay, four fifths of uh, both armies were uh, volunteers or uh, conscripts, meaning that they were drafted. Okay, um, this is not. Uh, neither side are made up of armies of professional soldiers. These are what we call green soldiers. These are guys that have never fought uh, before. Um, you know, there may have been some that fought, you know, in Mexican-American War in the 1840s, but, you know, um, there, there's not going to be too many that are still around from, from that war. And if they are, they're, they've moved up the ranks and they're, you know, now officers. Um, so most of the fighting men in this war are going to be um, – uh, are going to be green soldiers and uh, not professionals, volunteers or drafted. Um, you know, in the, the initial phases of the war, they both sides kind of thought that the war was going to be over quickly. That was not uh, to be the case. And, and that, uh, that really became apparent after the, uh, the, the first initial battles um, that, you know, when they saw the blood loss uh, from both sides, um, that it was going to be clear um, that we need to have bigger armies. So the reason I'm telling you this is because after those initial battles, uh, both sides do institute a draft. Um, this is, uh, I believe this is the first draft in U S history. Okay. Almost positive on that. Um, but, uh, in 1862, we will see both sides, uh, institute drafts and, uh, what are called forced conscriptions. If your name and number are drawn, um, yeah, I know in Vietnam they did it by birth date. I'm not quite sure how they drafted uh, in in this period, but um, if uh, if your if your number was drawn, you had to go. You were in the army. So um, you know now what we see here is that that it does play out differently. Um, in the the South, honestly, you had uh, a couple hiccups, I guess, with this the this draft. Um, Number one, Southerners did allow, allow for uh, exemptions, specifically uh, around the number of slaves that were owned. Um, any person that owned 20 or more slaves, um, basically you were allowed one white man exemption. So, um, you know, there were a lot of Southerners that, uh, from what I understand, were upset about this, that, um, you know, basically this is a, uh, you know, rich man's war, poor man's fight. Uh, and that's a phrase we hear a lot in modern warfare. Um, but uh, this is no example. Uh, another example of that, you know, 20, uh, for every 20 slaves, you get exempt um, uh, from, from the draft. Uh, you could also uh, th send a substitute. Uh, if you were wealthy enough, you could basically pay um, to, uh, uh, 
to, to send somebody else or just pay to exempt yourself. Uh, $300 in gold was what was required to exempt yourself from, from service for the South. Now, $300 is a lot uh, at that time. Um, on average, like a skilled worker during this period would make around $100 a year. So this is like three years salary of, um, of a normal skilled worker. So this was really only available to the upper, upper class. Um, but again, the South is going to be low on resources, including gold. So that was, um, that's one way that they tried to, to deal with it. Um, like I said, this did anger uh, a lot of people, you know, especially this idea that, um, um, you know, most Southerners were supposed to be in the, the, the model of Thomas Jefferson, these yeoman farmers. Um, most of them didn't have $300 laying around uh, to send off to this Confederate government. Um, so, you know, that, that phrase, rich man's war, poor man's fight, definitely plays uh, true here. Um, also on the South, uh, their drafts were not nearly as successful uh, as the North because um, the, of enforcement. Um, you know, the, the Southern government is brand new and there's really no enforcement. I mean, they are dealing with survival. Uh, you know, they're trying to make sure Richmond is not captured. Uh, they're doing whatever they can to survive. They don't have time to go out and enforce uh, draft dodgers. Um, so many of those that got drafted in the South didn't show up and that also uh, hurt their chances. Now, let's talk about the North really quick in terms of, of drafting. Um, for Northerners, uh, the draft was more successful, but there definitely were a, a few hiccups. You'll remember that at the very end of our unit, we, we talked about Fort Sumter, and um, we also talked about uh, Lincoln's response. Uh, we'll get into this later in case we didn't mention it. Uh, Lincoln's response of raising um, an army, he wanted states to volunteer. Uh, that was it. So Fort Sumter happened. Uh, Lincoln calls for volunteers and he basically set a quota for each state. And that's when uh, the rest of the, the Confederate states, the later states that joined, um, ended up joining the, the Confederacy because they didn't want to send, uh, they didn't want to meet their quota of volunteers. So anyways, um, that, that wasn't necessarily a draft. That was just um, a volunteer. But by 1862, uh, they are starting to um, uh, to set those, those volunteers, or excuse me, they are starting to set those drafts. Uh, when Lincoln sets out a call for volunteers, I believe it was 75,000. Um, uh, that, that volunteer quota was met by states in the North. It was met. So, um, it wasn't until really later. So I think I just said 1862, I think 1863 may have been the first, um, major draft. Um, Again, there were exemptions made in the North as well. There were substitutions made where you could send somebody to fight in your stead. So it, the, the same anger among the poor man in the North uh, was shared by the poor man in the South. Um, you know, the, uh, especially among immigrants that were, had just come to this country, all of a sudden be drafted in a fight. You, I mean, you really don't understand. I mean, there's a lot of people that are upset by that. So, um, you know, there's uh, the final item on this page, the New York draft riots, 1863. Um, I think this is really uh, an interesting moment uh, in, in this uh, story because uh, there's a lot of things that kind of take place in the story. So um, when they instituted this draft in 1863, uh, keep in mind um, the Emancipation Proclamation had also just uh, come out. This war will shift in 1863. It'll shift why it is being fought. And, uh, you know, the, the North had been fighting for union up to this point. But after the Emancipation Proclamation, many people realized that this is the time to emancipate the slaves and that they uh, are fighting uh, to end slavery. Um, not everybody wanted that. And uh, so, you know, you have a lot of anger, uh, especially when you are now told you have to go fight. When you get drafted, you have to go fight. Uh, for a cause that maybe you don't actually believe in. Maybe you do agree that slavery should be a right guaranteed by the Constitution. Um, so anyways, you got a lot of anger uh, among Northerners. But this specific draft riot in 1863, um, it was mainly conducted by German and Irish immigrants uh, in New York. 
And it really kind of began as, as uh, uh, anger over class injustice. Um, you had, uh, you know, you had what were called copperheads. Um, these were like anti-war Northern Democrats, these copperheads kind of stirred up trouble uh, early on saying, you know, Lincoln just wants to free the slaves. They were saying he's a radical. He's the one that's, that's, uh, you know, doing all this. Um, and they, they stoked that fear by saying, you know, if he frees all the slaves, they're going to come up North and they are going to take your jobs. Um, and so that was part of the fear of this, uh, that, you know, these German, German and Irish immigrants, they've just gotten there and they're having a tough time finding jobs, even at this point, uh, for most of them, uh, they don't want to be inundated with 4 million recently freed slaves coming in, trying to take, uh, their jobs. So, um, uh, sadly, uh, those that, that paid as, as many situations in history were, uh, were, were the innocent ones. Um, this specific draft riot um, saw black uh, neighborhoods in New York uh, targeted and burned. Uh, we know of at least a, a dozen African Americans that were lynched, um, that were actually killed. There was a black orphanage that was burned to the ground. Um, all this uh, before Lincoln had to to actually step in. He had to actually send Union troops into New York um, to put down the, um, uh, the, the riot there. So this is a, you know, this is a, a tough issue. And like I said, you can't throw a blanket on everybody and say that everybody was for it or against it. Um, the draft riots are a great example that not everybody in the North was, was a big fan of abolition. All right, moving on. Take a quick Diet Coke break here. Brought to, this lecture brought to you by Dico. <clears throat> All right, so moving on. Um, we only got a little bit to go. I promise I won't go too much longer. Um, talking about industry and infrastructure, man, another major advantage for the North. So got population advantage um, and now industry and infrastructure. Both of that, those should be really two separate items, but um, for, for both of them. So when this war begins, Who's, who can make products? You know, the, the factories are not located in the South. They've been more agriculturally focused. It's more agrarian. Um, so when it comes time to actually start making things like uniforms and guns, um, the South's going to have to import all of that. Uh, and man, that's just very, uh, very difficult. So um, the industrial capacity, when we actually look at um, the industrial capacity of the country in total, Okay, 90% of it, 90% of the nation's industrial capacity was in the North. In addition to that, four-fifths, okay, four-fifths of all the nation's banking capital, okay, so basically like the hard money, four-fifths of all the capital in the country in the North, okay? What was happening was, you know, Southerners, uh, you know, the plantation Southerners, I mean, there was a lot of money down there. It was all wrapped up, but it was all invested in slaves or it was sent to Northern banks. So now that the war has started, they're cut off from that money and the North has all the money. So not only can they make all the goods, but they also got all the money that they can then buy goods from other areas like Britain, who would supply a lot of weapons during this fight. Now, um, let's talk about the infrastructure, okay? And when we talk about infrastructure, we're talking about roads, bridges, canals, railroads. If you look at the picture in the upper right-hand corner, you'll see the differences uh, in railroad production between uh, 1850 and 1860. So the red, just the railroads that were present in 1850, right? Um, the purple built between 1850 and 1860. So you'll notice, look at the connections moving out west. Right, so the North is extremely interconnected um, between the Northeast and the Northwest. Um, but look at the South, and just look at the lack thereof of uh, of railroads. Um, three fourths of all the railroads were in the North. Okay? Three fourths of all the railroads were in the North. Um, so, you know, this war, you know, that that's going to be so important to get supplies to the soldiers, to get soldiers there in the first place. Um, you know, they're going to be able to reinforce much quicker. They're going to be able to resupply much quicker than the South uh, can. Um, 
part of this has to do with geography, but uh, frankly, they've just been building in the north decades before, and um, boy, it's really going to uh, to pay off for the northerners here. Um, the uh, the south, you know, I don't want to make it seem like there was no industry, and in there was, um, there was some. Uh, it is going to be extremely overloaded. Um, we're going to see that, uh, you know, there were some iron works in particular in places like Mississippi and Alabama. Um, but man, just severely limited, especially once the war gets going, they're going to be moving at, at maximum capacity and, uh, um, they are not going to be, uh, producing nearly as much as, uh, the North here. Um, now you might think all of this would make for, uh, you know, let me just double check here. Just want to, sorry, want to double check. Uh, sorry. Okay. Double checking, we're still recording. Uh, the, the Norse industrial advantage did not always make it uh, superior when it came to fighting, though. Okay, so I say advantage or disadvantage. They definitely had the advantages, but um, did that mean uh, that uh, they were superior in fighting? No. Um, not necessarily. In fact, you're going to be surprised how many uh, battles early on the South is victorious in. Um, but also, here's the other uh, item, is that, you know, the, the railroads are great, um, you know, that are all in the North, but they, those don't extend to the South. Most of this war is going to be fought in the South. Okay. Um, you know, at one point we'll see Robert E. Lee invade the North, making his way all the way up to Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania and Gettysburg. But for the most part, this war is going to be fought in the South, in Virginia, um, in Tennessee. Um, there's no railroads there. So is it an advantage to have all the railroads? Well, you can get your supplies as far as the railroad goes, but at that point, you're kind of out. So, um, you know, I, I think infrastructure kind of takes a back seat to some other characteristics, uh, such as population. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's still definitely in the Northern camp, but not as, as major of an advantage when it comes to infrastructure as, uh, some other items. Um, the, uh, you know, and, and just before we move on from that point, uh, the North is going to run into problems, um, with Confederate Raiders, um, you know, cutting supply lines. Um, you know, the deeper you go in the South, the longer your supply line is, you got to feed, not only you know these two million guys that are fighting, but uh, you know think about all the horses that are, are along with them. You know, we don't often talk about the horses. There, there's no tanks or cars. They're moving all this stuff with horses, and horses eat a lot. Okay, so you got to feed an army and uh, you know a, a, an army of horses. Uh, I'll tell you that's a lot of food, and you got to keep that supply line running if uh, you want want that to happen. The deeper you get into the south harder that is to do. So um, not only, and tele, uh, we'll talk about telegraph later on, communication, you know, the, the Southerners were, uh, that was one uh, kind of guerrilla tactic they would use would be to cut uh, the telegraph wire or destroy what railroad lines did exist. So, you know, infrastructure, um, definitely a, a, a plus for the North. Ultimately, it's not going to be a deal breaker because once they start fighting in the South, uh, they really don't have access to it. Um, from that point on. Um, let's talk about the economic resources of the, the South and the, the North here. Um, and I, I kind of went into this just a bit ago, but uh, most Southern capital was tied up into slaves uh, and land. Um, you know, they had spent all, invested all of their wealth uh, in, in slaves and land. Um, so when, you know, the North's going to try to push things like war bonds, um, you know, that are somewhat successful. In the South, there's no money. There's no money to buy those things. So, um, you know, most of the, uh, the capital, as I said, four-fifths of the capital is up North. Um, but even the, the taxable income, you know, we're going to see the first income tax uh, during this period uh, on the North. It, most of the taxable income uh, is, is in the North as well. Uh, most Southerners are farmers. So, um, you know, I guess they could send in, you know, corn or carrots or whatever, but uh, still most of the tax bowling comes in the North. So economic resources, the South is left lacking. Um, and, uh, you know, they would, they would try, they would issue treasury notes um, that could be redeemed like two years after the war. 
but man, they declined in value. I mean, especially after this war starts going poorly for the South, um, uh, what we're going to see is that by the end of the war, if you had purchased uh, a dollar note, like if you had put down, um, you know, let's say 75 cents or something and purchased a dollar note that you could turn in after the war, by the end of the war, it was worth a penny. And it was worth one cent. Um, so th those notes that were issued by the Confederacy uh, in an attempt to raise money, they declined in value. Uh, that finance is going to be a big problem. Um, this is one of the main reasons for the strategies we will discuss tomorrow. Uh, Robert E. Lee, uh, who was a, a brilliant tactician. I didn't say you know, he's not fighting for the right side or the right cause. I think it was Grant who said, I've never met you know, a more worthy adversary uh, with such a horrible uh, reason for fighting uh, is something paraphrasing there. Um, but, uh, you know, Robert E. Lee understood this, you know, why did he invade the North? Why did he go all the way up to Gettysburg? Um, you know, it, it looks like a blunder on paper the clocks ticking. Okay. He knows that he knows that their resources are drying up and he knows that um, the longer this war lasts, uh, the, the, chances are decreasing. Um, the, the odds are not in favor of the South. So they got to move quick. And that this, this economic uh, impact directly plays into their overall strategy. Um, the North, um, you know, I mentioned earlier that they have four fifths of the nation's banking capital. I've said that numerous times. Um, they, uh, they will use those financial institutions to, to back the war. They will use the banks and their money. Um, they will borrow from the banks and they will um, uh, use that money to, to fund this war. Uh, like I said, they do pass the first income tax in our nation's history, 1861, the first income tax. Um, a couple years later, they, they're going to pass another law called the National Banking Act, uh, which will uh, actually set up a, a new national bank. We talked about that struggle, uh, especially under like Jackson and all that. Um, and they will set a uniform currency. One of the long lasting impacts after, uh, like during this war and after is the invention of the greenback. Okay. If you if you got a dollar bill in your pocket, you got a greenback. Um, this is where our, our money starts to become uniform and standardized, um, from here into the future. So, um, you know, when we break it down, we're looking at things like population, we're looking at, at things like infrastructure, industry, economic resources. Um, almost every check mark is for the North. Um, the only thing that the South really has going for it is uh, their will to fight and, uh, and their leadership. And next time we meet, we are going to take a look at uh, both of those um, uh, items. We're going to look at the strategy, what the South is really trying to do to win this war. And uh, uh, we'll get the fighting started. Thanks for listening. And as always, please email me if you have any questions. Um, uh, also, hopefully you've written down some questions on the margin. I will be happy to answer those uh, on Thursday when we uh, get together online and, and you guys are more than welcome to ask me those questions live uh, if you don't want to email them to me. All right, guys. Thanks. Thanks a lot. And uh, talk to you later.